the, the whole process is really, really traumatic, really, when, when I'm looking back on it. And um, it, it's, it's, you, there's no going back from it, really, because, um, you know, you are changed forever visibly. I think I was about four or five here. That was like only a year or so into transition. There was no real investigation into um, the other mental health issues that I was going through or any other factors that could possibly be contributing to the feelings that I had at the time. I think depression kind of kicked in a bit more because I, I was without any hormones in my body and, you know, especially at such a young age when it's supposed to be, you know, at its peak almost. That's, um, yeah, very detrimental, I think. Since being on the blockers, he's absolutely flourished. He's come out of his shell, um, he's settled in a, a new school, um, and he's flourished um, academically, and I'm incredibly proud of him. Next, a 23-year-old woman is taking legal action against an NHS gender identity clinic, saying that she should have been challenged more by medical staff about her decision to transition to a male as a teenager. A judge gave the go-ahead last week for a full hearing of the case against the Tavistock and Portman NHS Foundation Trust, which is expected to go to the heart of the controversy surrounding the age at which young people become capable of giving informed consent to medical interventions to help change their gender. In a moment, we'll speak to the boss of the clinic, Dr Polly Carmichael. But first, let's hear from the woman. She's called Kira Bell. She's now 23 and she started taking puberty blockers aged 16, followed by cross-sex hormones, testosterone in her case, and she had a double mastectomy. Kira Bell has been speaking to the BBC's Alison Holt. I would have liked to have, uh, you know, some sort of intensive therapy, really. I think that I should have been challenged on the, the proposals or the, you know, the claims that I was making for myself um, and I think that would have made a big difference as well. There will be young people who say going to the clinic literally saves their lives because it is essential someone listens to them and believes their need to change. What would you say to that? Uh, well I did say the same thing you know years ago when I went to the clinic um, it felt like you know it was saving me from you know suicidal ideation and and just depression in general and it, you know at the time I felt like it relieved all of those mental health conditions that I was you know struggling alongside you know gender dysphoria it's something you need to kind of work through but it's, it's not something that should be rushed into it I think it's up to these you know institutions like the Tavistock to step in and make children reconsider what they're saying um, because it is, you know, a life-altering path that you're going down and um, it's, it's not guaranteed to work. Do you feel any anger about what's happened in the last five, ten years for you? I do, yeah. Um, I feel angry that, you know, no one was there to really um, say any different and I was allowed to run with this idea that I had or, you know, almost like a fantasy as a teenager, I was allowed to, to run with that and um, it has affected me in the long run as an adult. Well, let's talk now to Dr Polly Carmichael, who is the director of the Tavistock Clinic, NHS Clinic in London. Uh, thank you very much for coming on the programme. How can you be absolutely sure when a child or teenager comes to your clinic, that they do genuinely want to live as the opposite gender? I think the first thing to say is this is a really complex area. And the truth is you can't ever be 100% sure about a lot of things. And certainly in this area, you can't be 100% sure. Mm -hmm. Having said that, um, our assessment uh, process is wide ranging. It's over a long period of time. We look at the development of gender. We look more widely at relationships and how young people are doing in school and so on. And moreover, less than half of the young people who actually come to the service would ever be referred um, to the clinic. 
and for those that are, they continue to meet with psychosocial professionals to explore their gender and, importantly, think about a whole range of pathways. Right. Let's talk more specifically about what happens if someone does come to your clinic then. How many therapy sessions would you have with a young person before puberty blockers would be part of the conversation? OK, so we work um, according to NHS specifications. We're a commission service. And in the specifications, it says three to six. I think in reality... That, that's an hour long? That's an hour long, maybe longer sometimes. Mm -hmm. With two clinicians, I guess um, that's around giving young people a space but also giving their parents the space. And over what period of time would those three to six sessions be? So it, it would vary. It's all individual. It's case by case, but over a period of six months or so. But I think it's important to say that the reality is one outcome of the assessment period is not infrequently ongoing exploration and thinking. So Rather than rather at the end than, of that period prescribing yeah. puberty blockers. Yeah. Three to six sessions each about an hour long, two clinicians over a period of about six months. Does that strike you as not enough therapy and over too short a period? So I think if it were that after that period everyone was being referred to clinic, then, you know, I think there would be rightly questions. Mm -hmm. But the truth is often it's much longer than that. Um, and indeed, I think we're well aware of some of the concerns that have been coming out more recently around... Uh, large increases in numbers of referrals. There have been concerns about more assigned females being put forward for services. And I think within that, if anything, we're more cautious, more careful. We also have a network model, so um, young people come from all over the country. And uh, we convene professionals' meetings locally. Many of the young people we see have co-occurring difficulties. And so it's most appropriate, really, that any therapeutic input happens locally. Right. Uh, how can a child or teenager give their full informed consent to taking puberty blockers? That's what critics suggest they can't, and Kira Bell is one of them. Yeah. So, obviously, people over the age of 16 are able to um, give consent. And the consent process we have is a robust one. It's a process, it's not an event, mm. it's not one occasion where you obtain consent. Mm. But I think it's involved in numerous discussions around thinking about all the different pathways. If an individual is pressing for any physical intervention, there would be extensive discussions around their hopes for that, their expectations, ensuring they're realistic. There would be um, discussion around potential side effects, known side effects, unknown ones, unknown unknowns. Mm. And all of this before a young person even gets referred to the clinic. And then formal consent would be taken within the endocrine clinic. The first visit would only ever be a full discussion from um, a medical doctor around the treatment um, and education and so on. And so formal consent would never be taken until at least the second meeting. Right. Again, is that too soon? And again, how can a 13-year-old really give formal consent for taking puberty blockers, taking cross-sex hormones? Mm. Well, a 13-year-old is, isn't giving consent for taking cross-sex hormones. Um, there's a lot of misinformation okay, around... Well, let's talk about puberty blockers. Let's just stick with that. And Sorry, that, that was my mistake. No, that's fine. Um, but I guess um, blockers... Sorry, you were asking about informed consent. Yeah. Yeah. So I think young people are... I, my view is they are able to give informed consent. I think they're given full information around the intended action, the potential risks and so on, over time, on more than one occasion. I think there's also evidence in general that young people can develop, if you like, specialist areas of knowledge, um, sort of beyond their developmental stage, if you like, um, when, you know, there's been work around that particular area. And I think that's evidence that comes from paediatrics in general. Right. 
Do you mean why? Because they, they're going online and, and joining forums, so they, they have knowledge. I mean, well, I, I think that's very different. I think the knowledge that they obtain within the clinic is uh, robust knowledge based on the evidence. OK. Um, that's not always the case online. Kira Bell was 16, so she was able to give informed mm. consent as a 16-year-old. Uh, regrets. She says that your clinic did not challenge her enough. Mm. Do you accept that? I think we uh, do challenge, without a doubt. Um, my heart goes out to Kira. I think Kira is incredibly brave and speaks really well. I think it's really important that individuals can come forward. There's a place for them and there's a place to discuss this. But this needs to be kept in a context. Uh, the detransition rate is, across studies, very low, 0.3 to about 3%. Mm -hmm. And also, detransition means many things. So, for most, um, the reason that's given is around a lack of social acceptance, the loss of family and peer support. So, I think, whilst it is really important to think about that, we also need to hold in mind the many people who go forward and can lead a full life uh, with support around their gender identity. My son, this is from a viewer, my son started with the Tavistock uh, when she was at the time 13 years old. They've spent years counselling before treatment. And the only argument I have is that at nearly 24 years, he is still awaiting the final treatment. This caused depression and anger with things not moving quickly enough. I understand this, but I wish for my son to feel complete and happy with himself. Um, in terms of the puberty blockers, you will know that those who criticise the use of them in young people mm. say this is experimental treatment that mm. can have lifelong consequences. You're using a drug uh, which is most commonly used to or licensed to treat advanced prostate cancer in men and to chemically castrate male sex, uh, sex offenders and to halt very early puberty. It is not licensed to treat gender dysphoria in children. Mm. That is true, isn't it? So, I'm not a medical doctor, but I think you'll find that many drugs used in paediatrics are not licensed for use with children. Do you have any worries about the long-term effect on individuals psychologically, on their brain development, on their fertility? Mm. We don't know what it can do to people. Well, the blocker has been used um, for over 30 years, so I think there is actually quite an evidence base. Clearly, it's really important as numbers increase, awareness increases, that there is more research. But I think you have to weigh this up against the effects of not intervening. We're talking about young people whose sense of themselves does not match their physical body, and the distress associated with that is often huge. Finally, let me ask you why you think there has been an explosion in referrals of young people to gender identity clinics. In, 20, in 2009 10, mm. there were 77 referrals. 2018 mm. 19, it has gone up to 2,500. That is a 3,263% increase. Mm. It's astonishing. Why? Well, that's a really difficult question, and I guess there are you know, multiple reasons for it. I think we need to hold in mind as much as we're talking about um, transgender people much more actually this continues to be a marginalized stigmatized group and um, so part of that i think is likely to be greater awareness and that can be nothing but positive but of course we're also aware that there may be changes in the demographics and that we need to be if anything more cautious and I think as a clinic that is exactly the approach we take. Thank you very much for coming on the programme. Thank, thank you. you. We appreciate your time this morning. Dr Polly Carmichael, Director of the Tavistock. Thank you.